Okay, so let us uh, take a quick recap again. First order single capacitance between a uh, manipulated variable and a controlled variable. Second order to higher orders we need to see what we have seen up to now is for first order and a few special cases of first order your gain, capacity and lead lag. This can be constructed uh, by a combination of just the regular first order transfer function. When the time constant is 0, it becomes pure gain, a combination of pure gain and a lag becomes lead lag. Lead behavior generally as we discussed in the last class is more of a mathematical convenience. You do not find lead systems in practice, but it is good to understand mathematically because it helps us to analyze lead lag systems. Where do you guys see lead lag systems? You see it quite commonly in process systems around heat exchangers, reactor bypasses. Whenever there is a bypass, you can safely assume that there is going to be a lead lag system because the bypass, the bypass arm gives you pure gain like behavior and the regular uh, arm gives you the dynamics. So, a pure gain in parallel with dynamics essentially gives you a lead lag. So, whenever there is bypass, you should tune yourself saying that there is expectation of a lead lag. Okay. Uh, what else did we say? Um, yeah, so that is why we stopped last time and then we said you know, let us start looking at higher order systems. We started looking at systems with order 2. Whenever there is more than one order, there is always this um, possibility that there will be an exchange of energy between the two holdups. Um, not necessarily true always, but most of the times. And so, whenever there is an exchange of energy, you can expect oscillatory behavior. That is the physical interpretation. The mathematical interpretation is that when there is a second order, the denominator has a second order transfer function. When you are doing a partial fraction expansion, you will get, you might get complex roots. Complex roots when you invert into a time domain give you oscillatory behavior. So, that is a mathematical description. The physical description is exchange of mass or energy between the two holdups that would give you oscillatory behavior. Okay. So, that is what we saw in the last class. Any questions, any comments, just let me know. We saw this yesterday. We also saw that plants, um, even if they are of first order, if you put a whole bunch of um, devices around the plant, uh, such as a controller, such as a sensor, such as um, actuator, if those elements have uh, dynamics, then the closed loop system as you see here may have higher order, although the plant is first order. So, for example, um, the plant is first order, but all of that gives you effectively a second order system. Okay? And then there are some systems that inherently are um, second order in nature. Uh, that is because of the uh, uh, nature of the momentum balance that you put there. Uh, in this case, you know, if you if, if the uh, pressure in one arm is uh, different than the other because of a delta p, then you system dynamics can be described by that uh, force balance or momentum balance, and that momentum balance is inherently of second order with respect to height and delta p and so you get uh, inherent second order because of the nature of the uh, dynamics. Okay. Okay. So, now uh, the uh, second order transfer function generally as we said has uh, a denominator that uh, is of second order <coughs> and so it is good to have you know just like we have in a first order system two parameters that characterize the dynamic behavior. One is the gain and the second is the time constant. Just like that for a second order system, if you want to write a generic form of an equation, that generic form of the equation should look at the possibility of oscillatory behavior, the possibility of exchange of mass, the possibility of two holdups and all of that. So, a general second order transfer function will look like this tau square s square plus 2 zeta tau s plus 1 in the denominator and k in the numerator. Okay. As opposed to a first order, it was k over tau s plus 1, that is a pure first order. Okay. Second order will have tau square s square plus 2 zeta tau s plus 1 
and specific instances of what tau and zeta should be can be related to the system. For example, in the manometer, tau can be re related to L and G by that expression and zeta can be related to the viscosity, the density uh, L and G by that and of course the radius by that expression. So, if you look at this kind of a just call it. If you look at this kind of a transfer function, it will generally generically represent all kinds of second order systems. Specific values that tau and zeta would take will determine the nature of the oscillations. For example, zeta is a damping factor, it determines the dynamic response. Okay. So, if zeta is less than 1, okay, it is a special case of a second order which is typically called as an under damped system. An under damped system is the one that will show a relatively high oscillatory behavior in response to a stimulus. A under damped system happens when zeta is less than 1. If zeta is equal to 1, it becomes critically damped. If zeta is greater than 1, it becomes over damped. If it is critically damped, or over damped, there is a non oscillatory response to the steady state. In the under damped system, there is an oscillatory response to the steady state. So, if zeta is less than 1, the chances are that the two uh, inherent holdups in the system are linked in such a way that they exchange energy and so there is an oscillatory behavior if zeta is less than 1. Okay. If on the for example here, what is zeta? Zeta is mu over rho r square 6 L by g. What is the design parameter there? The design parameters are in fact the nature of the fluid, uh, viscosity and density. It also is dependent on R, L and G. Okay. Now, if I design the U2 manometer in a way that that zeta value turns out to be greater than 1, then the moment I apply a delta P onto the U2 manometer, it will not show me any oscillatory behavior. It will just go and settle to a new value. There won't be any exchange of mass. Okay. But if I design that to be zeta is less than 1, then it will turn out that there will be oscillations. Just like you know, if in a, in a first order system, if I design the first order system, the area to be very, very narrow, then the time constant will become close to 0. In that case, the system responds like a pure gain system. Now, that is a design parameter. Okay. We discussed when we talked about uh, dynamics being a help, when we design a surge tank prior to a distillation column, upstream of a distillation column, if we design a surge tank, we necessarily want to make it of large area because that time constant will essentially dampen out oscillations. So, you know you can look at design or some of the design parameters to set zeta so that you get either an oscillatory response or a non oscillatory response. Okay. So, zeta determines that. Okay. Now, tau is what is called as the natural time constant of the system. I mean you must have all studied this in pendulums, you must have all studied, studied this in um, spring systems and the like. right? What is the natural frequency of a system? How do you define the natural frequency of a system? Huh. No, but what is the natural frequency? No, but what, how do you, how, if I were to ask you, define natural frequency, what will you say? If the system is excited at the natural frequency of the system, what happens? Resonance, sustained oscillations. Huh? No, that is dissipative. Let us not worry about the dissipative. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So, what is really happening there? What is really happening there? Why is it continuing to stay there? What is it? What, so, how do you define the natural frequency? I, now you have all digital radios. Old times we had those knobs which we used to turn and that would change the capacitance in an RLC circuit. What changes there? The RLC circuit is an oscillator. When I change the knob, I change the capacitance. It is a disk type of capacitance. The overlap between the two disks changes when I move the knob. So, what changes? The capacitance changes. Because of that, what changes? The natural frequency of that oscillator changes. It changes to what the driving frequency, which is the M transmission, the frequency of that and the frequency of the oscillator when they match, 
the oscillator vibrates or receives that frequency to the maximum amount, power dissipation is maximum or power transfer is maximum, right. So, natural frequency is that frequency at which if you excite the process, the power transmission is maximum, right. Take a, when you are driving a vehicle, there also if you do not tune your driving to the slope of the road, chances are that your vehicle, if it is a gear vehicle, if it is automatic transmission, it will shift to the next gear, otherwise it will stall. Then there is something called as a natural frequency of the system, right. That natural frequency, because oscillations are involved, is associated with a time constant which is tau. A reciprocal of the time constant is a natural frequency. Time constant is of the order of minutes or time units. Reciprocal of that will be per time unit, which is frequency, number of cycles per year, per per uh, time, per unit time, right? So tau is called a natural time constant, or inverse of tau is also what's called as natural frequency. Okay, so if you divide that entire expression by tau, you can also write this as omega square n square, omega n square s square plus two zeta omega n s plus omega n square, and that will also be an equivalent representation. We'll see that a little later. Okay. So, the important thing to realize of higher order system is always this possibility of energy transfer, mass transfer, momentum transfer because of which you might, you will get oscillatory behavior or you might get oscillatory behavior depending on the value of the damping factor zeta. Zeta is less than 1, oscillatory behavior, zeta is equal to 1, brink of oscillatory behavior, zeta greater than 1, non-oscillatory behavior. Okay. Let us look at some of the responses of underdamped systems. Underdamped systems, um, if I subject it to a step, okay, then I can write the uh, um, output expression in terms of those. There are actually three terms, 1 minus the first term minus the second term. Okay, there are three terms in there. Okay. So, if you look at that expression, it seems to suggest that this is like a first order because the first order also had 1 minus k e to the minus t by tau. Here you have 1 minus something e to the minus t by tau 1 something minus e to the power t divided by tau 1 minus tau 2. So, it is suggests something like a first order, but the key differentiator between a first order and a higher order is given by this expression over here. The initial slope for a second or a higher order is necessarily 0, whereas what did we know from a first order? For a first order system, what was the initial slope? What was the slope for a first order system? Hmm? Finite, it was finite, it was k by tau, it went like that, okay. it went like that, whereas second order starts with a 0 slope and then changes. Okay, so, dy by dt necessarily is 0 for second or higher order systems. Again, uh, there is a caveat to that. Okay, we will see what that caveat is, but in general, higher order systems will exhibit a 0 slope, initial slope, and then they will it will rise to a steady state. Okay. So, now we can see that as t tends to infinity, the steady state value of yt will be a k. A is the the amplitude of the step and k is the gain, so it will go to a k, right. This is true of over damped systems, over damped systems where is it? so you see that there is no oscillatory behavior here, it is like a monotonic increasing, there is an inflection, little inflection point here and another inflection point here, but there is no oscillatory behavior, okay. So, this is true of over damped second order systems. If I have critically damped second order system, the response will also be similar. What is what differentiates an over damped to a critically damped value of zeta? If I put zeta equal to 1 in that expression, then I will get a different um, dynamic response. It will be similar as the over damped system, critically damped also looks very similar to the um, over damped system, so initial slope is 0. But look at what happens if there is an underdamped system. If there is an underdamped system, because you have complex conjugate roots, zeta being less than 1, you have complex conjugate roots, you get into sine and cosine terms. 
when you have sin and cosine terms you would expect an oscillatory kind of a response. Okay, the, can you see the oscillation here and then eventually it will die out but it is an oscillatory term. Right? Questions? Any questions up to this point? So, when we apply first uh, a step to a first order system, we do not have to differentiate between these three except maybe perhaps uh, absence of uh, opposing force which gives you an integrating system or absence of dynamics which gives you a pure gain system or a regular first order lag system which gives you a, a non-zero initial slope and settles to a steady state. So, there is not much richness in a first order response. Second order response depending on the possibility of energy transfer or mass transfer uh, depending on the value of zeta you might get either oscillatory behavior or non oscillatory behavior that is damped critically damped or under damped. Okay. Okay. Now, this, this kind of uh, takes you takes us to an important before I, I jump into this okay, let me just spend some time trying to give you the context of this slide. So, we said that um, so, so let us let us just bring in a little as little bit of control okay. So, we said that you know if we have a plant and we represent what we can manipulate as an input on the block diagram, what we need to control as y in the in the block diagram and we call this a plant right. So, for example, steam increase results in temperature increase right. We show that relationship in this plant P. If we want to control what we say is we measure this y and we send it via feedback. So, there is a sensor let us call that as S is a feedback there is a comparison with the desired value of y temperature and then a controller determines or sends a signal to an actuator which determines what the steam flow is ok. So, if you have to do this design we have to find out see the actuators is fixed by design, plant is fixed by design, sensor is fixed by design. The only thing that you need to design when you are looking at control systems is what is this C this is a question mark we have to determine what this C is ok. Now, if you have to determine that you essentially need to when you design a car for example or when you design a pressure vessel or when you design any, any other ok. If you design a car a Maruti and a Innova or a Nano are necessarily different because there are certain specifications kept on each of them and Innova is supposed to be carrying 7 passengers all of that. Uh, nano is supposed to be light and you know, composite material and all of that right. So, there is a certain design specification that is kept to evolve the design. Likewise, when you look at control systems, the controller has to be designed based on certain specifications ok. What is that specification on? The specification has to be related to the objective. What is the objective of a control system? What is the objective or what are the objectives of a control system? First class last slide, last slide in the so not first class but the first slide deck in the introduction I said why are control, why should systems be controlled? What are the objectives of control system? That is performance related. What is the first primary objective of control system? Safety. Safety performance. So, now you say transferring of variability from where it hurts you the most to where it hurts you the least. That means, you want y d to be equal to y all the time. You are not willing to accommodate any shift, tolerate any shift. If you have the specification and suppose you come up with a situation where it is not possible to have y equal to y d, you need to be able to tolerate deviations. Then what would you do? You would essentially say fine if a controller cannot be realized to have y equal to yd at all times, let me minimize the error between y and yd. So, he said minimize yd minus y squared which is the error between the output and the target 
and cost of variability is a transfer variability where it hurts you the most where it hurts you the least it hurts you the most in y so you minimize yd minus y square it should also hurt you the least so you minimize the cost of control which is integral of u square whatever control effort you are put a cost factor to both cost factor to the output variation cost factor to the input variation minimize the cost agreed agreed yes or no yeah you want to minimize deviation from target you also want to minimize cost so whenever whichever costs you find out sweet optimum you will want to operate there correct so now how do you translate this opti optimization formulation into specifications on what the closed loop behavior should be for example in this transfer function on this block diagram if yd changes if yd changes from a step or maybe some other target how can this happen if all uh, uh, aircraft is flying at 8000 uh, uh, feet and he has to go to 10000 feet he or she pilot can be a she also the apologies okay he or she wants to go to 10000 feet there is a change in target here yd okay so when yd changes you want this to faithfully track yd number 1 number 2 when there is a disturbance here or here whenever there is a disturbance you want y to be tracking yd so there is going to be a dynamic response of y whenever there is a stimulus on the disturbances or whenever there is a stimulus on the target set point is it either there will be a wind wind gust that will cause the aircraft to go off track or there will be a deliberate kind of signal from the air traffic controller go go to altitude 10000 then uh, the pilot has to respond so this control system has to faithfully make sure that y is equal to yd no matter what uh, stimulus affect the closed loop correct okay so for this we need to de determine or specify what is an acceptable dynamic response of the system okay and that's where this slide becomes important okay so let's go back to this slide this slide becomes important because it says that given a general second order system that could result either because of inherent uh, second order nature or because i have a first order and controller and different elements together which gives me a second order i want to have specifications on my control systems so here is one such specification one of the specification is if i have an oscillatory behavior rise time tr is one specification i want the rise time to be as small as possible okay if i specify that the rise time should be as small as possible this response will be very steep but what is rise time defined as the time at which the output first hits the eventual steady state value that is defined as the rise time i want that rise time from a control system point of view to be as small as possible Okay, we will see what other specifications are there, but this is one of them. Now, from this response, can you tell me? This is this is the response of a underdamped second order system. Can you tell me how do I calculate what is the rise time? Huh? Put y is equal to y d or a k. In this case, it's going to reach its steady state value, which is a k. So, in that equation, set y t is equal to a k and solve for t. how many solutions can you get not infinite several okay yeah it'll, but it is damped no eventually it will settle to steady state so it can't be infinite it's a finite number of oscillate uh, oscillations it will settle okay when will it be infinite good question when will it be infinite when will there will be sustained oscillations In this case, there will be infinite oscillations. Hmm. The amplitude will be very small, but the oscillation will be. Eventually, at least theoretically, you will see that it will reach steady state. It can't have infinite oscillations. But I'm saying mathematically, there is an opportunity for y t to assume a value a k. Okay. and at some point in time it will approach that asymptotically not oscillatory 
correct so there is a finite number of oscillations the question is how do you calculate which is the rise time from all of those okay now but before that we have that interesting question can it have sustained oscillations huh? no so suppose i have a utm manometer what is or an rlc circuit rlc circuit everybody is familiar right when can it go into sustained oscillations i initially supply energy and i stop that energy will get dissipated where in an rlc circuit resistance in a utube manometer where will the energy get dissipated what are those friction at the walls because of viscosity viscosity Visco viscous 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 viscosity contributes to dissipative forces. If these are absent, if I have an ideal fluid in a utube manometer, zero viscosity, nothing to stop it, right? So when zeta is equal to zero, I will actually get sustained oscillations in the system. There is no um, nothing to uh, dissipate that energy. Correct? Agreed? Okay. Now in this case, how do you determine this this rise time? The smallest or the first uh, root that you get for time is what you will choose as the rise time. Now I will not I, I will not derive this, but I expect you to derive this. The rise time given this this second order expression of an under damp system will give me a rise time as that expression. Okay. If I now put zeta equal to zero in this, what happens? What is the rise time? Tau by tau by so what does that mean? What does that mean? If what cos inverse zero is pi by two, pi minus pi by two is pi by two. So what does it mean? Tau r is equal to tau. Zeta is equal to zero, so that denominator term goes to zero. So pi by two tau. What does that mean? How do you interpret that solution? Okay, no. I think you people are not thinking. Please think. Okay, so you think and tell me what happens when zeta is equal to zero. Okay. Now, the second important criteria for a control system specification is one is you want it to rise rapidly. Okay. There could be a second criteria. The second criteria is related to peak time. Okay, how long does it take to peak? Okay, and then settle down. So, how long does it take to peak? How do I calculate that? It's simple. I just differentiate that and set to be equal to zero and find the first time, the smallest time, and that will give me the peak time. Okay, this is the second uh, specification. There could be a third specification which says. Overshoot. How much over the steady state value will the output peak, and after that it gets dampened. So the ratio of A to B is typically called as the overshoot. Okay, in a thermally sensitive um, application, I don't want that overshoot to be large. If I am processing ketchup and I am doing temperature control for evaporating the fluid from or the water from the ketchup mixture, I don't want That tau, that tower should to be substantially large. So I'll specify, you know, how much the maximum, uh, what overshoot I can tolerate. I'll specify that. Okay. Now, how do I calculate overshoot from that dynamic expression? I mean, the the ultimate expression, eventual ex eventual expression that will result is this. But how did this expression come? Steady state value. So take the difference, and you should be able to get the overshoot. Okay. So that's something you want to do. I put the expressions there. You may want to do that. The other thing is what's called the settling time. Now, we define for a first order system the settling time is four to five times the time constant. For a second order system, the settling time is also also generally follows the rule. But a second order system has more than one time constant. So, which one, which time constant will you choose? You understand? No, for a first order system, I said four to five times the time constant, the system will settle. For a second order system, there are several time constants. Ah, so two time constants. 
Which time constant will I choose and say 4 to 5 times? Fastest one, slowest one, which one? Huh? Slowest one, it has to be the slowest one, the fastest one will anyway settle and the steady state. So, I am concerned about how long the system is in, di in dynamic condition that will be determined by the slowest time constant. 4 to 5 times the slowest time constant is the time it will take, but then there are specifications on what a settling time is. Settling time is when the output first reaches within 95 percent bound bounds. So, 0.95 times y and 1.05 times y. It reaches within those bounds the and stays there. Okay, so it has to reach and then stay within those bounds. So this is the time, the earliest time in which it first enters those plus minus uh, five percent bounds. That is the settling time. For an oscillator system, that is what you define as the settling time. So you can <coughs> again calculate that from expressions. And so these are the specification that generally okay. There is one more. Decay ratio. Decay ratio, I do not want my system to be in sustained dynamic state over a long period of time. So, I just want to look at the ratio between the two over, first two overshoots that determines the decay ratio. Second overshoot, first overshoot, the ratio of that is what I will call as decay ratio. Okay. Control systems decay ratio also uh, is important. You want to it to settle quickly and so you want the decay ratio to be small as possible. Okay. So, now all of these are specifications that you would impose on any oscillatory response. I am just going back here. The first one we said was the rise time, second is the peak time, third is overshoot, fourth is settling time and the fifth is decay ratio. Designed, you will provide specifications on all of this, but you see they are mutually conflicting. For example, if I say that I want a quick rise time, a very short rise time, chances are that my overshoot will increase because the system has so much energy, it takes so much energy is fed into the system to reach this in the shortest possible time that it will necessarily overshoot and you may not be able to meet the specification on overshoot. Okay. Likewise, you know, if, if on the other hand you say that system should uh, uh, be, be able to reach settling time with a very small overshoot then the rise time will be compromised. It might probably take go like this and then so the rise time will become larger. So, it is essentially a compromise. These are mutually conflicting objectives. You will have to specify them carefully to you know uh, get an acceptable dynamic response from the system. Okay. So, what I would expect is, oh there is one more, sorry, there is one more period of oscillation, it is a time period between two peaks that also you can calculate the period of oscillation. Okay. So, questions up to this point, any questions up to this point? Six specifications that are important, last one we, you know, the period of oscillation is also related. So, six specifications, uh, I would expect that you at least take a shot at deriving those expressions that are put on the slides. Okay. You have the general underdamped yt for a step input, second order system. Take that starting from there, derive all of these theoretical expressions. It will be, it will give you a good understanding of how these dynamics uh, evolve in time. Okay. Okay, so, now in the first order case we saw a sinusoidal response, a second order system also you can you can analyze and it has some interesting behavior uh, as when compared with the first order system, right. So, that is a gen generic second order system, okay. So, as a second order generic second order transfer function, okay. If I apply us is equal to a sin omega t and do the partial fraction expansion. I will get two terms coming from a sin omega t, you take it to the Laplace domain, you get two terms coming from the second order nature and you have the a by s term, no you do not have the a by s, sorry, and just four terms coming from there. If you consolidate all of that, you will essentially get an expression of this kind which is similar to what you saw for a first order system except 
I mean the similarity is that if the input is uh, input input frequency is omega, the output frequency is also necessarily omega. Why? Because because why is the output frequency also omega? Because huh? Huh? Why? Say that. Huh? Linear, linear system because the system is linear. It is a linear second order differential equation. It is a linear system. So, the commonality is that the output frequency is also omega. There is no exchange of energy across different frequencies. The energy gets transferred to the same frequency in the output. Okay, That is the first observation which is similar. The expression also shows a phase lag. Just like what you see in a first order system, there is a phase lag. So, that also is similar. The difference is in this term, in the first order system you had what in the denominator omega square tau square plus 1 square root of that, that is what you had in the denominator. Now you have a slightly different term, okay, a k over this, here the phase lag is also given by this and okay. Now the first thing that you need to see or understand is we defined something called as a natural frequency. What did we say was a natural frequency? Working definition was if I apply energy at that frequency, I get maximum power transfer. Mathematically, we said omega is equal to 1 by tau, where tau is the natural time constant, is a natural frequency. If I put that into this expression, what happens to this expression over here? What is phi? Huh? Minus pi by 2. Okay. That is the first observation. Okay. Notice that it is independent of the value of zeta. Whether there is uh, damping or not, it is independent of that. If I apply omega equal to 1 by tau, I get maximum energy transfer. The driving force omega, I mean the driving signal A sin omega t matches the natural time constant of the system, I get maximum tra transfer no matter what the value of theta is. We agree? Agree with that. That is that, that's the first point. Okay. Yeah. Correct. But if it is a driving and we have a causal system, then the effect has to lag the cause and so we know that it is minus pi. Okay, you are right, you are perfect, mathematically you are right that it can be plus or minus, but then we have to resort to engineering explanation and say that since a, a cause results, uh, sorry an effect results due to a cause, there is a lag between, uh, you know, there is, so it, it has to be minus. Okay. Now you look at this expression over here, now, so this expression is different, there is a 1 minus omega square tau square uh, plus 2 zeta omega tau. So, now let us see, I do not know if I want to discuss that here, no I do not want to discuss that here. We will discuss that when we are looking at frequency response, but if you have done this in RLC circuits, you know that at some point somebody mentioned about resonance, resonance frequency. What is that resonance frequency? Omega L is equal to 1 by omega C. What is omega L and what is 1? So, what is omega L? L omega is what in a RLC circuit? Huh? No, in, okay, so lead, in terms of lead and lag, induction, inductive element gives you a lead or a lag, capacitance gives you a lead or a lag, are you sure? Are you sure? Rethink your answer. Inductance is generally a lead element. Capacitance is a lag element. Okay. When the impedance associated with these are the same, omega L becomes equal to omega C. If at that time there is no dissipative element, omega the, the resonance resonating frequency, then the response from the system is uh, towards maximum power transfer. But let me discuss that more clearly rather than uh, clutter things here. Right now, let us just understand these things. 
that it is similar to a first order. Uh, the difference is that phi is related to the natural frequency as well as the damping factor. In some special case when omega is equal to 1 by tau, damping factor does not matter, okay. You will still get maximum power transfer, okay, alright. Okay, so I think uh, logically this may be a good time to stop.